you can't use Doug's character, Gareth. And I said, I don't want to use Doug's character. She goes, great, but I've got your, I've got your, um, your outline and your sample chapter and Dareth's in them and I need to replace them. We need a sidekick for Wolfgar. And I said, I don't care. give me a week, I'll come up with something. She says, no, I don't have a week. I, I looked at the clock, it was almost lunch. I said, okay, I'll go to lunch. Instead of eating lunch for you, Mary, I'll come up with a character, I'll call you this afternoon. And she said, you don't understand. I'm standing across the hall from the conference room. I'm late for, the, I'm late for a meeting and I need a sidekick for Wolfgar. And I don't know how it happened. It's nobody I ever played in a game, nobody I'd ever thought of before, but off the top of my head, I said, a, a dark elf. And a long pause, and she says, drow? And I said, yeah. And now the wheel started spinning. And I said, drow ranger. Nobody's ever done that before. She said, Bob, there's probably a reason nobody's done that before. I said, no, 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 this will work, a drow ranger. And now I'm starting to think of this Fritz Leiber, Fafford, and Gray Mouser type of scenario, you know? And um, she says, uh, we're going on and on and on. She says, you know what? Since it's a sidekick character, I'm late for a meeting. I'm going to let you get away with it. What's his name? And off the top of my head, I said, Dritz the Warden of Damon the Shez been on the ninth house of Menzer Baron's on. She said, why? I said, I don't know. She said, Menzer Baron's on? I said, must be a city. She said, what's this other stuff? I said, it's probably the formal name. I don't know. Can you spell it? Not a chance. Um, that's how he was born. So he wasn't supposed to be. He was a sidekick because I needed, off the top of my head, I needed a sidekick for Wolf. Kind of a lucky break for me. The first scene I wrote when I sat down to write the book, which I only had three and a half months or two and a half months to write because they were on a tight deadline. And I was working full time and I had a three-year-old and a two-year-old. My wife was seven months pregnant. So it was kind of crazy time. But when I first sat down to start writing the book, the actual book, first draft, the first scene I wrote was Drizzt running across the tundra when he gets jumped by these yetis and is saved by Bruno. And I was about a page and a half in when I realized this isn't Wolfgar's story, it's his. And he just spoke to me. Everything changed right then and there on the spot. So, but I do this with a lot of my characters. I don't know who they are. I have an archetype in mind, right? And but then as I get to know them, they tell me who they are. It's like meeting people for me. I'm, I'm a big pantser, not a, not a plotter. And so I got to know them. And the more I got to know them, the more I liked them. Visually, I never expected this to happen. But it wasn't until I saw that cover that Larry Elmore did for the original, the original cover for the Crystal Shard. And that's when it really started to crystallize to me of who he was. I don't really see my characters that way. I have a general feeling of what they look like usually. Sometimes I do, because sometimes I know who I'm basing them on. Um, like for, and my, my newest Demon War series that came out, The Witch Owlin, was based on the Natalie Dormer portrayal of uh, Anne Boleyn and the Tudors with that crooked smile. So I, I kind of have an idea of who I want them to look like. But I don't, I don't really get too wedded to that because, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't overdo it with the descriptions, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but so it wasn't until I saw the first drawing of him, which was that Larry Elmore cover, that I really started thinking of it in those terms. I wasn't sure I was going to get another shot. My other book was with a different agent who it wasn't. I, he hadn't sold it. Um, I really liked writing the book, but it wasn't, I didn't think it was going to be a career or anything like that. But I wanted to write another one. So at the end of the crystal shot, I threw in a couple of hooks. I had Bruner faking he was dying to get Dritz to agree to go find the, his home. And I had Regis walking into the town and seeing this assassin with a jeweled dagger and knowing who it was and knowing the guy was after him. So I just threw a couple of hooks in. And then I got the second book. And I did it over the course of a year. And then, then I got, I had a lot more time to do that book. Then I got the third book and that one hit the New York times. And that's when they called me up and said, you might want to quit your day job now. Um, so it, it really, it's almost like writing found me. It wasn't a plan. 
I had, you know, by this time I had three kids, three little kids that we had to take care of. And my wife and I were trying to build a family and I, had, I was building a career. And it wasn't really until, I would say, as I was writing The Halfling's Gem that I began to think, maybe this is where I'm going to go instead. And then when The Halfling's Gem came out and did really, really well, plus I had gotten better contract terms on all the books by that point. I had gotten the, my percentage moved up nicely to where it should have been. Um, and... And I, and I saw that I, I actually had a chance, I can make a living doing this. That's when I started telling my boss, you know, no, don't, don't promote me because there was a big position opening up. And I said, you know, don't put me there. I'll stay right where I am. And I figured I would just keep working for, you know, a few more years at the job I was doing and writing on the side. But then writing just kind of pushed it out. The first book, I didn't understand how big a deal it was. I, I'm like I said, I'm not in the I'm not in the community. I, or then I certainly wasn't. I was a blue collar kid who used to that paid his way through college working in a plastics factory and bouncing in nightclubs. Um, I the first book came out, the Crystal Shard came out, and it did really well. It was like number three or something on the Walden's book, the barn, the you know, with the Walden's, they had they used to have the listing, and there it was. And it did really well. And the second book did better. It was number one on the Wallens list and, and the B. Dalton list. And, and then when, but when this one hit the New York Times, what happened was like the orders doubled. Because at that time, if you hit the Times, you would get in like Kmart, Reader's Market. You would get in all the, all the um, supermarkets and the, and the uh, drug stores. You'd get in all the little areas. All they carried was New York Times bestsellers. And was, this was still paperback. But that was a big boost, obviously, for me. Um, not as big a boost as when I got to do a hardcover a few years later, but as, as far as thinking I could make a living at it, that was really when I realized I could make a living at it. That was kind of cool. My name was on the New York Times list, right? That was kind of cool. 